Well, good morning and welcome home. My name is Wade. I'm the pastor here, and we're so glad that you're here. As Devin already said, thank you for your patience this morning. Uh, on this day every year is when we re-enter all of your information into all of our systems, which makes the line go a little bit longer. But you only have to do that one time a year. Let's give a round of applause for only once a year. Thanks for doing that. Also, for those of you that parked at our additional parking offsite, thank you for helping make space. If you didn't know, we have additional parking offsite just up the street. We have two shuttle buses that get you in and out to make your uh, time here a little easier and faster. And also, uh, we've doubled the size of our 8 o'clock service over the last couple of months. And so, for those of you that are up early, like to get up early, or want to help make seats for those who have a better fit at this hour. Next week, I would love 40 or 50 of you to take the shortest mission trip of your life and join us at the 8 o'clock service. Same worship, same teaching. In fact, it's about five minutes shorter of a sermon, which may be just what you need to put you over the edge to come to 8 o'clock. Anyways, really glad that you're here. This week, I just celebrated uh, my 24th wedding anniversary with my wife, and I am, yeah, thank you, married to an absolute superhero. We have three kids, 16, 14, and 11. Our first child was a boy, and raising a boy, I really had no idea what to do. And so, you know, I'm a guy, and so you don't know exactly what to impart, but you try to do your best, so you start with what you know. Caleb, when you eat a corn dog, don't be too aggressive. There is a stick in there. Yes, you can pee in the yard. Never, ever, ever root for Alabama. Basic, basic, <laughs> basic. I know some of you are like, we ain't coming back. That's okay, fine. There are other churches that don't love Jesus. We love Jesus here. <laughs> and so you feel like you have some stuff to give. But true or false, when you bring a child home for the first time, show of hands, how many of you were freaked out and overwhelmed? Yes, if you're not, you're lying. Jim Gaffigan, the famous comedian, says, many feel quite often unqualified as a parent. And he says, I call this being awake. <laughs> Because we just feel that way. And then the hospital gives you the child and says, good luck. Good luck? What do you mean good luck? They're like, yeah, good luck or you're going to be back in the hospital and we don't want to see you again. So good luck. I mean, when I leave Ikea, I get a tool and a manual. When I left the hospital, I got good luck. The only thing that they really wanted to know was, do you have a car seat? And did you wrestle 45 minutes with that thing to get it secure? Because if you didn't, it's probably not in there right. Parenting is a challenge. Influencing others is a challenge. And even if you're not a parent, you're an influencer. And this series is called Influence. Because the reality is everyone in this room is influencing others around you, whether you know it or not. We're a disciple-making culture. We want to be disciples that multiply disciples. And every person in this room, young or old, parent, grandparent, student, kid, you're making disciples of something, intentionally or unintentionally. The question is, what influence do you have and what sort of disciples are you making? And being an influencer, being a parent's a challenge. Like, how do you know when you're winning? I love sports, and I watch sports. I know who's winning because there's a scoreboard. I ran a business for years. I get a P&L statement. I know if we're winning. But as an influencer, as a parent, as a disciple maker, how do you know? And quite often we're like, man, we make mistakes. We say the wrong thing. We embarrass our kids. And we're facing so many different challenges globally and locally trying to figure out how to navigate a new school year, and many of you are brand new here, and you're trying to get into a new community. There's so many challenges that we're facing, and everyone, parent or not, knows in their heart that there's a gap between where they want to be and where they feel like they are currently. And we know, like, God, I want to have better influence. And I feel the weight of wanting to walk into my purpose, but I feel the distance of the gap. And so, welcome home. So do we. And the good news is God has a plan for influencers. 
And for thousands of years, God has given his commandments and his vision and his purpose for what it means to be an influencer of others and to live a life that flourishes. At the church at Nolensville, we believe the creator knows what leads to human flourishing. And he has a plan for your life for influence today. And we're going to talk about it. So I want you to get your Bibles. Open them up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you're brand new to a Bible, grab the front cover and go about five books in, and you'll find the book of Deuteronomy. While you're opening to Deuteronomy, I want to shout out to those of you who are watching an additional seating to make room in here. Can y'all give a big round of applause to those who are sitting in additional seating? Thank you so much. And listen. We love the word of God here. We base our lives. We are willing to risk our lives on what God has said. So we go to God's word for wisdom. And so Deuteronomy chapter 6 is one of the most profound statements in Scripture. And I'll begin in verse 4. And it says this, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving to you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Lord, thousands of years ago, you told Moses how your people would flourish and how we would find the life we desperately want, and you've spelled it out. So help us, God, to not only be those type of people, but to be influencers of others to do the same. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you're new to church, amen just means I agree. And so we're going to be studying for the next couple of weeks the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy is the longest recorded farewell speech in the Bible and perhaps really in all of history. And Perhaps what you'll notice is some really profound things that Moses had to say. And in this series of sermons called Influence, you're going to see that Moses, the author of Deuteronomy, had a mission from God. And his mission was to equip God's people for the life that God had for them in the promised land where they were supposed to thrive. And Moses' mission and mandate For God's people was to remind them, you have a future. You have a new land and a new hope and a new life. And it's a pivotal moment in the life of the nation of Israel. And in this moment, God wanted them to know and ensure that they did indeed love him. With all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength, that they would need that in order to thrive And then he's calling them to pass on that love and devotion to the next generation. And so God is inspiring Moses to write. And it's so profound what we're reading today in Deuteronomy 6. So profound that hundreds of thousands of years later, when Jesus walked on this earth, the enfleshed God, the word of God walking with humanity and was asked, hey, What is the most important thing God has ever said? What's the weightiest thing that God ever said? Jesus actually quoted in that moment what we just read. He said, you want to know what the creator wants? You want to know what God wants? And he just quoted what we just read. And this section of scripture is what Orthodox Jews call the Shema. And it's so profound that they recite it several times a day. And it's this daily reminder that the life that God has for them, a life of flourishing and a life of thriving, is found right here. Because as I said, the Creator knows what leads to human flourishing. And He wants us to know Him and spend our lives impressing that love on others. And so the goal is to produce this like vibrant, 
like attractive type of faith that not only lives in us, but is given to others. And so what we believe here is the word of God is living and active and it searches the hearts of men. And so let's take a moment and look back now at some of the things that Moses wrote and Jesus requoted as one of the most profound things God ever said. So look at verse five. He said, love the Lord. What's this word right here? I'll keep you here to the 11 o'clock. What's this word? Yes, he didn't say love some distant God. He didn't say love some other God, some strange God. He said love your God. He's a personal, intimate. He's your creator. Love your God. Know him. Be known by him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And this, this word heart over here, man, it is profound. It has a real different connotation actually. And it's not like emotional. We think about heart as like the root of all of our emotions. But, but in Hebrew, this word is actually quite complex. It describes really your innermost self, the person that you are when no one's watching and you're actually honest for just a minute about who you are. That's the heart. It's your deepest desires, the longings that, that only you and the Creator know. And you think He doesn't know, but He knows. It's that innermost self, the hidden secrets. It's actually who you are. Not who you pretend to be, but who you are. That's why Proverbs says, guard your heart above all else, for from it comes the course of life. So that's why he says, I want you to love me with actually who you are, not who people think you are. Well, your heart. And then he says, with all your soul, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about souls. It's, it's been said that there's really only two things that will last forever. The word of God, Mark 13, and the souls of men. That's because the word of God is imperishable, but so is the souls of mankind. It's the part of who we are that will last forever. I don't know if you know this or not, but your body does not last forever. And at 45 years old, I'm like, Amen. Because when something starts hurting me now, I'm like, well, I'm just going to have to deal with that forever. Anybody else feel like that? Like, man, I feel like my knee hurts. Well, I'm just get used to that because the back nine is full of bumps and bruises and aches. Amen? So praise God that the body that I have now is not the body that I get forever. But you are not a body with a soul and a spirit. You're a soul that God has given a spirit and wrapped in a body. Your soul. And the soul really describes the intensity with which you run after God. That's birthed out of your soul. The reason why church is so hard for some people because they just try to white knuckle it on the outside, obey some rules and do some stuff, it doesn't last. The intensity and the passion is birthed out of a soul that's been changed and my soul has intensity for what it's captured by, what it's enthralled by. And then my life and my action and my devotion and my future will follow. So let me explain it to you like this. The reason why he says love me with your soul, because that's the center. That's actually who you are, your soul. That's who you are. And then from there, what happens in my soul bleeds out to my heart. And that's where the intention and the affection begins to take root. And then from there, it impacts my mind. So my soul leaks to my heart, which then impacts and directs my mind, which then impacts my decisions, which then impacts my relationships. But it's from the soul, the intensity with which you run after God, that makes a change in every other part of who you are. But it begins at a soul level. A soul level. And see, here's the problem. The reason why I know it's a problem because I didn't go to church or learn about Jesus till I was 19. And the people that did try to talk to me about God or the thoughts that I have and the changes I tried to make is from the outside in. And so as influencers, as parents, as other people, so often, man, here's where we want to start. We want to start with relationships. Hey, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go about it this way. Or we try to attack decisions and you go, hey, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do that. And there's a lot of things we should do and a lot of things we shouldn't do. But, man, I thought following Jesus was just 
you know, moralistic deism. When I'm good, he loves me. When I'm not, he doesn't. So I tried to base all my passions here. And then I was like, well, it kind of affects my mind, but my mind doesn't really want to have different decisions and relationships. The problem is we're working backwards, and then we, we never really get to the heart And then ultimately, we never get to the soul because we're working out here. And you can't work from the outside in. You work from the inside out. And Jesus isn't just about modifying your behavior. Jesus wants to hit your soul. Because if you just deal with this stuff, this never changes. But if you deal with your soul, everything changes. And the reason why it's so problematic to allow the changes out here to define us is because that's why many of us spend time being tossed about, restless. Nothing seems to satisfy. There's like insatiable longing for something else. Part of the reason for that is because we're just we're trying to make a difference here. You, you start at the soul. That's why Jesus says, you can gain the whole world and still lose your soul. So we're in danger, church, because every decision we make as influencers has a cost. And many of my choices have left me in regret. But Moses' mission and Moses' mandate from God was to make sure that there was a group of people somewhere, the people of God, the family of God, the chosen nation would start right here, soul, heart, on fire, bleeding out into their lives, live it out in such a way, and then impress it upon the next generation. Pass it along. And that's what he says next. Look at verse 7. He says what? What's the word? Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you sleep. Repeat. This is another really powerful and interesting word. Repeat in God's word, talks about this this indelible sharpness and precision. It's an image of of like a stone mason with a big block of granite sitting in front of him and holding a chisel and with painstaking precision and commitment day after day, time after time, carving into that granite exactly what he wants it to read and say. And day after day, time after time, he's committed to imprinting this on the granite. And granite isn't easily moved or shaped, but he's not discouraged or dissuaded, but he's committed to imprinting this because once he imprints it on the granite, it's there forever. It's there. It's imprinted. It will not be shaken by storms or rain or anything else. It's there. And you can go to cemeteries and history museums and find things that were imprinted on granite that have lasted for generations and generations. And God is saying, influencers, with those around you, take the passion in your heart and in your soul and day by day by day by day. Repeat and imprint. Repeat and imprint. I didn't say beat them. That was a joke and you missed it. (laughs) I said imprint. Because what God wants is a group of people with a passion for their creator and a love for Jesus so firmly imprinted on their soul and their hearts that there's nothing that'll take it away. Cannot be removed, cannot be touched, cannot be erased. It's imprinted. It's there to stay. And that's why he says, do this with all your strength. Because it's not easy. 
I feel like as a pastor and a parent, I fail way more than I succeed. But I am committed to the daily task. That's why he says when you get up, when you lie down, when you walk, and when you ride. And for me, I spend a ton of time in the cars with my kids. I told the group last week, I feel like I'm just an Uber Uber driver to their best life. Anybody else? But that's purposeful time, church. I lay them down at bed. It's purposeful time. I redeem the moments. And Moses is saying it doesn't happen by accident. It's a constant repetition. There's a life that God has for you that leads to human flourishing. And it's found this way, a daily imprint, a daily lifestyle at home, at work, laying down, getting up along the way. And can can I tell you what one of the most powerful daily imprints I make on my, my kids and my family? As I look at them on a regular basis and I say, man, I really messed that up, but I'm sorry. Hey, you know, I handled that poorly, and I'm sorry. Hey, I didn't give you attention in that moment, and you needed it, and I'm sorry. Hey, I was distracted. Hey, I raised my voice. Hey, I'm sorry. I lead from a place of desperate need for Jesus and demonstrate first my need for the gospel. And if you know what the gospel is, it's the good news that the Savior and creator of this world stepped out of heaven and into earth and demonstrated God to us. But he didn't just demonstrate God to us. He died for us, was crucified, buried, but kicked the end out of a borrowed tomb and rose again for me. That's the gospel. So every day I try to demonstrate my need for the gospel before I tell them specifically why they need the gospel. I need it too. Not to be saved again, but the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And he who began a good work in me is going to bring it to completion. So I still need Jesus. And yes, you do too. So we're influencers. I try to base everything I do on what God says because he leads to human flourishing. Which is the different than most of the models out there today. The model that you'll find most often today is what they call child-centered parenting. Which means children, they would say, have a quest for autonomy. And every parent would agree with that. And they would say, the problem is, you need to love your kids so much. You need to be such an influencer that you don't really want to change them or upset them. They're basically little adults on their quest for freedom. And don't impose your values. Don't impose your viewpoint. Be just like some some sort of a guide on their journey. And the Bible has a big Greek word to define that, and it's called baloney. <laughs> because God's word is what should inform us as influencers. Most parenting manuals outside of the Bible, if not all of them, believe kids are morally good or morally neutral. Just help them be well-adjusted. Let them find their natural tendencies. No, kids need boundaries. We need to imprint on them what God has said. Do you know what a child's natural tendency is? Do you know what it is? Sin. Watch any kid. They are not born morally neutral. They are born ready to wreak havoc on your home. I remember training our kids to eat. Hey, this is how you eat, and this is what you do. Handful of spaghetti in their hair. Baby, don't do that with the spaghetti. Handful of spaghetti on the face. No, use your fork. Handful of spaghetti. Look at you in the eye on the floor. Where do they learn that from? How many of you and your spouses are sitting down for dinner, and you're like the lady in tramp moment, and you're feeding each other, <laughs> which is really fun. And they're like, oh, apparently that's what we do around here. Environment is not the culprit of everything we want to change. Kids are born that way. Mine, mine, give it back, give it back. You're not my friend. How many of you are talking to each other in the house like that? I mean, some of you maybe. You shouldn't, but we have to teach the next generation, train them a love and trust for us and a love and trust for Jesus. So influencers, let me tell you one of the first things to write down is this. 
Kids learning to willingly obey their parents helps them willingly obey their Savior. Part of your role as an influencer is to say, hey, follow and trust me as I follow and trust Jesus. So Paul said to the church, follow me as I follow the Lord. Part of them learning to trust and obey and submit, be willing to receive the imprinting on their heart from you is their first step in learning to receive from someone else, obey someone else. So they learn to obey and trust you. It helps them later learn to obey and trust and love Jesus. So as you love and trust and follow Jesus, you're helping them, hey, love and trust and follow me. And the goal we talk about all the time here is not to just create little robots that do whatever we say, however we say, because my greatest fear for my family or your family, we talk about all the time, is that we teach kids to obey us publicly but then they do whatever they want privately. And they know how to play the game in front of us and in front of everybody else, but they leave these secret lives. That's not the goal. No, the goal is to, to change their hearts, to show them why you passionately love and serve Jesus and to teach them to do the same. As influencers, you're the first impression of what God is like. You're a picture of the gospel, the grace, the goodness, the humility, the love, the discipline of our Savior. And in preparation for this sermon series, I talked to several of our biblical counselors and others, and we have seen a rise in our generation of a group of people that are very embittered towards their parents especially their dads. And the father womb is one of the most pervasive and difficult wombs that biblical counselors are dealing with. It leads to regret and frustration. And so as a fellow influencer who happens to be a male, I want you to know, man, I've got scars from the way I was treated, and I've got scars from the way I've done it to others, but I feel impassioned, empowered, and burdened for the role that we have to do. And you are influencers, the pastors and leaders and shepherds in your home. And our role with you is to come alongside you and equip you and walk with you. And our next gen team, I think, is the best on the planet. And yes, it took you 20 minutes to get back there today, which I know we said won't be the case next week. But we are with you for an hour here. And there's 168 hours in a week. And we want this hour to be powerful. And we will we be with you throughout the week. But our primary job is to be a partner with you in the journey. The two institutions that God gave for influence is the local church and the home. And that partnership together is profound. Profound. And in your partnership, the most fundamental task of parenting or influencing is teaching and modeling the gospel for your children. Model a transformation in your own heart that's easy for them to see and follow. Ultimate authority and love and grace from God demonstrated to you. Show your children why you love Jesus to help them see why they need to love Jesus. Most of what a child learns is caught and not taught. So you have to model it. Capture their hearts early. Influence them. And if you want them to listen later, help them to listen now. So a couple of things that you can write down to help you be the influencer God has called you to be in whatever realm he's placed you this week. Number one, step one. Wherever you are, start when? Now. Wait, I feel like I've failed. I feel like I've done it wrong so long. I feel like I don't even know where to do. I don't know where to start. I don't even know what first step to take. We will help you. The God of the universe stepped into creation. 
bore the wrath of God so that you don't have to. You don't have to perform or pretend. You get to be a child of God, loved by God, empowered by God to step into a new life. The resurrection power of Jesus means new life can begin for anyone and everyone every day. God's mercies are new every morning. So wherever you are, start today. The gospel is nothing if it's not about new beginnings, brand new days, brand new starts. We are with you. God will empower you. And those of you who feel like you're doing it alone, if you're a single parent, a single influencer, we will be with you double time. No one is alone. Not only do you have the empowerment of the Lord, but you have a church and a group of people who say, you are not alone. We can do this. I don't care what last week looked like. You can start this week. Man, it's too far gone. No, it's not. You can't change everything this week, but you can begin to demonstrate your influence in a new way. You can't change every old habit, but you can begin to walk in one new one. You can't erase hurt, but God can heal it. You you can't take away scars, but he can shape them. Wherever you are, start now. The gospel is a gospel of new beginnings. Step two, begin to imitate. Imitate Jesus because the people you're influencing will imitate you. Let's make it easy on them, church. Let's work hard. Let's play hard. Let's laugh loud and often. Let's make much of Jesus together. We can influence the living God who's changing us. We can imitate that to others this week. You can love. You can open your Bible. You can pray. You can confess sin. All of this is a part of that imprinting impact on the next generation. You can begin to imitate. And for those of you, man, I have a deep burden and desire for you to belong to community. Jump in one of our groups. Join one of our women's Bible studies. Get into our men's group. Give us a year to help other people imitate the gospel to you so that you can imitate the gospel to others. And maybe that's where you need to start this week. It's like, I need to put myself around other people in this journey that I can walk with. Great first step. I love my group. My wife loves the women's Bible studies that she's a part of and teaches. We need people around us encouraging us. You're not done. You can make it. Let others imitate you and you can imitate that. Step three, integrate. Opportunities are everywhere and class is always in session. Always in session. Integrate. Wherever you are, start this week. Begin to integrate your faith in one new way in the life of those you're influencing and see if it doesn't begin to make profound impacts. And don't expect it to be perfect. I have had to take people that I'm influencing and like, hey, you need to go to your room right now because you ain't helping this Bible study. So if you think that every time a pastor sits down with his family and it's like, okay, everybody, huddle up. Let's all pray, let's all confess sin, and let's all sing kumbaya for 45 minutes. You are dearly wrong. It is hard work, amen? But we are purposeful to integrate. And when we don't do it right, we have a family meeting today to talk about better ways to integrate this school year. Guys, what what would help you, we're going to say to our kids, what would help you this year for us to integrate, integrate together? Part of the way we integrate now that they're older is buy-in from them. What works for you? What rhythms do you want to establish? But we are committed every day, failure or success, to imprint each day, imprint. And then I would say lastly, maybe, maybe the most important is this, equip to launch. Listen, influencers. Psalm 127 says, children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. Children are like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. To be imprinted on, there's a creator that leads to flourishing. I'm going to etch it on your heart, etch it in you in such a way that the world can never scrub it out of you. And then I'm going to launch you into that world as a kingdom advancer, as a darkness disruptor. And I'm going to send you out to make much of Jesus so that the world rumbles where you walk. We are influencers 
And we are kingdom advancers by the way we shape the next generation. Those that we are influencing are not accessories to our lives. They're not burdens to our schedule. They're arrows given to us by God to be launched to make much of the king in the world. And I can't wait to see all the arrows be shot out of this church. We will touch the nations here. We will shape the world. We will influence for the glory of Christ. We're committed to it or we'll die trying. And so influencers, you, you, you need to know. Here's a quote I want you to hear. A famous theologian said it this way. He said, when you take what God intends to be kingdom advancers and darkness disruptors, and you turn them into just decorations for your own life, not only do you thwart the plan of God in their life, you can discourage them from faith altogether. End quote. The gospel began to make the most sense to me when I saw it lived out in the context of mission and purpose and kingdom advancement. When people said, hey, come, come give your life away here. Hey, come serve here. Hey, come on a mission journey here. Hey, come be a part of this. And I began to see not only others, but myself begin to have a faith that thrived and a, a light begin to come alive inside of me when I put flesh to my faith. You want your faith to come alive when you and those that you influence begin to live out your faith and we can help you serve and connect and mission journeys and begin to give your life away. It will become so vibrant inside of you. You can't contain it. The gospel makes sense when it's a gospel that's on mission. So parents, you need to know children, man, they're arrows. And arrows are designed to be launched. Launch them into the greatest adventure the world has ever known, which is knowing their creator and making him known, knowing God, finding freedom, discovering their purpose, and making a difference. That's the kind of influence that we're talking about. And whether you're a parent or not, you're an influencer that can help us. This is not only about the advancement of the gospel. It's about the advancement of joy in our life, and our kids' life. This is about me modeling to my kids that the American dream is also a nightmare. That there is a greater purpose and plan to our lives that the kingdom has for us. And what I want to do as your pastor is not only model to you, but to my family, that this gospel, this Jesus, this good news is so great and so glorious and so profound that I'll spend my life for it and I'll die if I have to. Because this world's just a vapor. And my soul is going to meet my king one day. And while I'm here, I want to be an influencer an influencer in the next generation. My invitation, come go with us. With all your wounds and baggage and hurts and brokenness. I've told you my story a thousand times. I grew up in a dysfunctional, addicted, alcoholic home. My parents were divorced. I was chasing the world and I saw Jesus Changed people's lives. I got saved. My parents got saved. They were divorced, remarried, and spent the next 20 years being influencers to my kids. Don't you tell me there's a family too far gone. You tell me your story. I'll tell you about my king. I'll tell you about the 81-year-old man that was baptized just a couple of weeks ago after his wife prayed for him for 50 years. influence. You have it. How are we going to spend it? Here's what I want to do. I'm going to invite our next gen team to join me. And those of you who have any area of influence over a kid's life, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, if you have a direct sphere of influence in the next generation in one way or another, would you just stand up? We want to pray over you. I want to pray God's blessing over you. Thanks, man. Just wherever you are, stand up. You're an influencer, and we are here for you. Lord, God, I lift up 
um, each of these parents and grandparents and aunts, uncles, God, those who are influencing this next generation, God, I just, God, I pray that they would cling to you, that they would draw near to you, Lord, and God, that you would draw near to them. God, that they would see that you are their source of strength and wisdom and guidance. And God, you give them everything that they need um, to lead their kids um, in your gospel and your truth, God. And I just pray, Lord, um, God, that you would give them the courage to step out yep. in faith, Lord, right. to do this, to this. God, it's not easy in this world. God, I just pray, though, that you would give them everything that they need, God, and that they would today, Lord, that they would start to lead gospel-centered families, Lord, to lead their kids um, for you and your gospel advancement, God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would um, just be with the church, Lord, as we come alongside of them. God, let us be a place where we would um, encourage, admonish, and, and give what they need in order um, to build them up to lead these kids, Lord, to be in the influencers that you have called them to be, God. And we love you so very much. In your name I pray. Thank you. If you don't know Kelsey Lynn, she's our kids minister from birth to fifth grade, and she will be your partner. She will be your advocate. She will be your friend. If you don't know her, you need to know her. Let's give it up for Kelsey Lynn. Yeah. John is our next-gen minister who oversees birth through 12th grade, but most of his focus is ninth through 12th grade. And so what I want to do now is I want to pray for those of you who have an active role in our education system, whether it's homeschool, public school, private school. If you're a janitor, you work in the cafeteria, the library, you drive a bus, you're the you know, crossing guard, doesn't matter. If in any way in your role that God has you, you're an influencer in our school system, remain standing and would everyone else take a seat? Those of you that are in some way responsible for our education system, yeah. John wants to pray for you. All right. God, thank you for all those uh, here and uh, throughout town that, that influence our children through the school system. God, I pray that you'll have their hand, your hand on their lives, that, God, that they would have enjoyed their, their summer. And as they uh, get uh, moving forward into the school year this year, God, that you will have your hand on their lives. Thank you for their sacrifice and their influence on our children. And God, I pray from the admin and principals to the super subs and uh, teacher, teacher assistants, the, the support staff, the resource officers, everybody throughout the whole building, that God, your hand will be on them. You put a hedge of thorns around all the schools. Keep everyone safe. Uh, Lord, we pray for safety, but especially in today's culture, you keep everyone safe. God, you be glorified this year. I pray the children will grow up just like Jesus in wisdom and stature. And God, uh, you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all give it up for our next-gen team.